It's interesting you said that about that the snakes having like the lizard teeth apart from the fangs. Most people would be shocked to hear that it could you could describe snakes as lizards. Would you mind like going into that a little bit? Yeah, certainly. So, um, uh, snakes are a subset of lizards. It's it's not that it stops being a lizard. It's still in the order Squamata. All snakes are in the order Squamata. They don't stop being lizards when they become snakes. Conventionally, and we have a colloquial convention that we consider if it's you know that it's not a snake any that is not a lizard anymore. It's become a snake now. But you know, we're 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 getting into monophyly and taxonomy now. So no, it didn't stop. It's still a lizard. We are still apes. Birds are still dinosaurs. Birds didn't stop being dinosaurs when they became birds. Snakes didn't stop being lizards when they became snakes. Welcome back to the Reptiles and Research Podcast. Now you're in episode 19 now of the, of the Reptiles and Research Podcast. Today's guest is Aaron Ra. Aaron makes amazing evolution videos on YouTube and I wanted to get him as a guest to talk to us especially about reptilian evolution and especially snakes and where snakes come from. This episode was really, really detail heavy. I've tried my best in providing as many B-roll and our interpretations of what these prehistoric animals would have looked like. Um, if you're listening via just audio, you might want to switch over to the YouTube channel to see all the images and the scientific names of ancient species when they're mentioned during the podcast. Little thing to mention is when I was in the actual call explaining to Aaron what we were going to cover in the topic... Aaron jumped straight into it, which is cool. He went straight into the deep end. So that's why it might not seem like there's not much of an introduction and like intro into it. So you might feel like, hang on, this isn't the start. Have I missed a bit? No, there is the start. It's just a very abrupt start. So don't be put off by that. It's just the way this episode started. Fantastic episode. You'll learn a lot. There are some species that I never knew about before, before being introduced to Aaron and his content. So you're going to love this episode if you love taxonomy and ancient creatures. Without further ado, let's welcome Aaron Ra. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring us. They are helping make all of this possible. You can find the links to them in the video description. Thank you to everyone that continues to turn up to our Patreon show, Keeper Chats. It's amazing to touch base with you guys face to face each month. Your support in running the channel is really appreciated. If you would like to join us over on Patreon, you can join us at patreon.com slash reptiles and research. And finally, if you enjoy our content, please share it on social media to help other nerdy keepers like you. Welcome to the GoFundMe for the Ball Python Deep Dive Project. This is an episodic docu-series. We want to include all the relevant studies on ball pythons and then weave that into the story, weave that into the journey of discovery for the viewer. But this isn't just a documentary, we're doing real science at the same time. So we're creating an international study on how ball pythons use their enclosures. And then finally, we want to analyse all the interpretations, all the footage of wild animals. Bring it all together, extract the data from studies, look at this holistic viewpoint and then identify the gaps and then go out to Ghana ourselves and film those gaps. We want to go to Ghana with a team of professionals and film bull pythons in the wet season. Will there be so much flooding that bull pythons are forced to climb for refuge? Or will they just be moving in their environment? Let's find out. Either way, we'll show what we find. This is something of an order of magnitude that has never been done before. We want to set a new bar and put it right up here. So if you would like to help in any way to make this possible, then please check out the GoFundMe. So basically, I just wanted to go over the evolution history of snakes because you made those wonderful videos, um, a little bit of the venom. I think you're going to be able to blow a lot of people's minds here when you talk about the taxonomy and stuff because that's not my strong point my strong point is animal welfare and how you look after the things when oh. you bring the taxonomy and stuff i think it's going to be a, a real eye, eye opener for some people well thank you so much yeah i've, I've always been fascinated with taxonomy and it, it's it's strange because it's not something that it seems to appeal to practically anybody but it but i've always found it very very interesting so um on on snakes you have a uh, 
the the most basic type, the blind snakes, the worm snakes, the, the, the probably the, the easily the most primitive, and they're they're little known, although they're they're all over the world, and people have probably seen them. They're they're usually very tiny snakes. They're often mistaken for worms. They're so small. Uh, and then there's uh, the other sub subset, the the next least or the yeah the next most primitive or the the, the slightly more advanced version, the henophiids. Henophiids are these heavy-bodied snakes. These are the boas and the pythons. Now, the, the, it's not fair to say that that either one is more primitive than the other. They 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 grew apart. One of the advancements, if you want to call it that, for boas, boas are are generally considered the most primitive of all snakes. They don't have the heat sensing pits that pythons have, but boas also give live birth which, you know, pythons lay eggs. So a couple of different ways of distinguishing them so that we generally consider, you know, uh, viviparous versus oviparous to be more advanced, but, you know, not necessarily so. Uh, and it and it also shows that, you know, that, that there, there's a common ancestor there. One did not evolve from the other, if that makes sense to you. If, boa, if boas had evolved from pythons, they would have the heat-seeking pets. If pythons had evolved from boas, they would give live birth. But, you know, so we know that they dist they distinguish from something that was closer to what we typically call a blind snake or a worm snake uh, or a better analogy, a madstoid snake, which is an extinct group because there, there are snakes enough. There are snake families in the fossil record that don't exist anymore. And madstoids are one of those. So it's something that's it, it's. Uh, the renderings that I've seen, the and the the analysis of the of the vertebrae and everything, show these to be intermediate between the blind snakes and the henophiids, which are the heavy-bodied snakes. So this was something that uh, one of them, and I can't remember the species name, was quite large, but it was effectively what we would call today colloquially a blind snake. It was just a big one. And so it's like intermediate between that and, you know, our boids. There are, you know, hinefids, the pythons and boas. Then there's a subset of those that became a bit more advanced uh, because boas and, and pythons still have two lungs, or at least they have a rudimentary lung. Uh, there's, there's one lung, and I can't remember with, whether it's always the left lung or if it's always the right lung, but I, I think it's always the left lung that is more reduced. And then uh, with the... Calubroids, which is a subset, they have only one lung. It's one elongated, body-wide lung, and uh, and they are arguably the more advanced type. And it's from Calubroids that we get all of the other varieties of snakes. Now, there's there's certain subsets of little known snakes, little little obscure references that people won't recognize that are in the periphery here and there. But most people's idea of any any snake that they're familiar with is going to be in the colubroid subset. And just to keep things easy, uh, colubroids develop into colubrids, of course, which are your rat snakes, corn snakes, king snakes, milk snakes, and garter snakes, and all of that sort of thing. What we call it, we used to call that a junk taxon or a, you know, a junk dork uh, category. We would just put like everything that wasn't a python or a boa. We would put in there, and now we know. Now, now we use colubroids for that, and we recognize that there are certain subsets for lamprophiids, for example, as an intermediate between colubroids and elapids. Elapids is the family that has your coral snakes. The, the only American elapid is a coral snake, and then you have cobras and false cobras because there's a lot of intermediates. It, 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 False cobras are a lot of them. If they're elapids, then they are themselves intermediate between uh, the basal elapid and the cobra. In fact, the king cobra, interestingly, is a false cobra. It's not a true cobra, which is kind of interesting because it's the king of cobras, but it's not a cobra. And uh, Australia is overrun with elapids. They have basically two kinds of snakes. They have elapids and um, they, they have pythons. So all the boas... That, that may have once existed in Australia are extinct. Uh, you, you find very few boas in the old world, like in Africa or Madagascar. I've got a species behind me that's from Madagascar, quite beautiful. But most of the boas are now restricted to the, the Americas, where in most of the pythons uh, have gone extinct in the Americas. We have like one remaining python in 
in like Central America, and that's it. So the Deboas, the Deboas said, okay, we're going to take the western half of the world. The Python said, we're going to have to take the eastern half, and and that's it. That's our ter- territories. But in Australia, they have pythons or they have elapids. So if it's not a constrictor, and you know, constrictors are pretty obvious, the big, heavy-bodied ones for the most part. If it's not a constrictor, then it's deadly venomous. They don't have snakes like we have in the in the U.S., where most of the snakes that we have are perfectly safe to go out and pick up. The venomous ones are easy to recognize. The cotton mouth, the the, the rattlesnakes, the, uh, the 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 coral snake, of course, is very distinct. Uh, the copperhead, and um, is that oh, the only other thing we've got that's venomous? I think after that is garter snakes, which were only discovered to be venomous. You know, I remember when I was a kid, and they they, they were reclassifying with these things. They don't have fangs, but they are technically venomous. It's just it's no worse than a hognose bite. As a matter of fact, a hognose bite is worse because hognoses have fangs. They're just, they're rear fanged colubrids. All the colubrids have fangs in the back instead of fangs in the front. Elapids have fixed fangs in the front. And then one of the other branches of colubroids are the viperids. And vipers, of course, with the, the rattlesnakes, the water moccasins, the things that you know, Americans are most used to. And those have fixed fangs. And there's a developmental difference in the way that the, the elapid fangs and the viper fangs developed they both started out as rear fangs or at least the i think the viper the viper one started out as rear fangs and then there's an embryological change that you can you can see in the embryology of the, the organism it starts out as a as a rear fang like a regular colubrid and then moves forward because the fangs on uh colubrids can move they can they can manipulate their teeth a little bit so this developmental change put it up in the front of the mouth and so now they fold. And so now vipers can not just walk their fangs like the, the, the colubrids can, but they can actually swing them out like a switchblade, which enables them to have really long fangs. Which is why I can handle, I've got a couple of, of venomous uh, rear fanged colubrids behind me, and they're perfectly docile. They're really one, wonderfully calm. I Once they're out of the cage, I can handle them safely, but they're very cage defensive. So I when I take them out, I take them out with a hook or I have gloves on, and I'm perfectly safe in doing that. But the gloves are meaningless when you go against a viper because their fangs are going to punch through that shed. <laughs> so you, are, I, I saw from your videos you have a, a false water cobra, and what, what is your other rear fang species? Is it hognose? Hognose. We have a western hognose, yes. Yeah, I watch hognose is quite a lot. The, the, the uh, false water cobras, they are... Uh, they can deliver quite. A, aren't they quite toxic if they could deliver the yield of many yeah, other species? That's the advantage. Uh, the brother of the female that I have uh, last week bit the the owner of the the, the pet shop that I got these from. They there was a, they were offering a sale, and when they when I when I saw that they had false water cobras co- cobras at this price, I couldn't walk away from that. I've been looking for a female falsy for a bit ever since I got my mail and I, I just couldn't walk away from that price. And, and she got the, the owner of the shop got bit by the brother of mine. And she, sh- I got pictures of her hands. She she holds her hands out and one of them looks like a balloon. You know, the, the, the snake just tagged her in the finger and you know, these are rear fangs. So they don't, they don't have grooves. They're not injector fangs like vipers and elapids. They inject They're hollow hypodermic needles. But the rear fang colubrids, they have to chew it in because the only way to get the venom into you is just it's just in their saliva. So they have to rip the wound, much like a Gila monster or a monitor lizard, because monitors are venomous, too. And believe it or not, iguanas are venomous, just very mildly so. They used to be more so, so but they have a vestigial venom so that it looks like in their evolutionary past, iguanas were probably more venomous or excuse me, probably more um, uh, carnivorous than they are now so that they've moved to this vegetarian diet. They don't use the venom so much anymore. So they have, they have a vestigial remnant of it. It's still technically venom. It just doesn't have the toxicity that we have to, we have to assume their ancestors once possessed, but all of these that don't have injector fangs or they don't have grooves in their fangs, because that's part of the evolution of fangs. 
uh, they have to chew their venom in. So like when a monitor lizard gets a hold of you, and that's bad, uh, I've gotten nailed by a, by a Malaysian water monitor once before, and it, their bite is horrific. Uh, it's not so much what the venom does, it's just what the bite does. But then the venom, and I, at the time when I got bit, monitors were not recognized as venomous lizards. There was you know, the beaded lizards and the, and the Gila monster, which basically the same thing. These, these were the only venomous lizards that were recognized by science. But when I got bit by my Malaysian water monitor, I didn't need a scientific study to tell me that I was envenomated. That was obvious because that boy came packed with a, with a, 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 a hematoxin so that the water was spraying out of my body. It was just coming out like water, like water, no kind of coagulation at all. So I had it on, I had my, he, he got two, two, two teeth. He stood up in his hind legs. I didn't know that he could do that. I was a, I was like 20 something. I was an idiot. So I'm thinking I'm the human. I'm the boss. You know, I'm three foot taller than you. Yeah. I'm three foot taller than a lizard. Uh, and he stood up in his hind legs. I didn't know he could do that. And I, and I just start messing with him. Like, what are you going to do? And he jumped straight up in the air and snapped at me. Which again, didn't know he could do that. And I yanked my hand back and he closed his mouth and I got two, two teeth scrape across my finger. That's all. I didn't get a bite. I got two teeth scraped across my finger. Nice, clean cuts. And the water came out or the, the blood came out like water for two days. I had it under a pressure bandage for two days before it began to clot, began to clot. Can you imagine late in the next day? It's still just pouring out. Can you imagine if he'd gotten a bite on me. And I've seen people who get bit by these things. That it's always a bloody mess. You know, yeah, I experienced it myself where I just left a shop next to work, but we had crocodile monitors there. And um, I was, I was cleaning geckos and here's someone just, just, just shout. And I'm like, what? And he, he's always someone that like just pisses about. He's always like the clown. And he yep. was like, the crocodile monitor just bit me. And I was like, yeah, all right. And then all I see is him and the boss like rush to the kitchen. It's just like pouring blood everywhere in a trail behind them. So I had to like go <laughs> in with a mop and bucket, try and clean up all this blood behind them really quickly. And it's just sprayed up along the walls across these vivariums that were for sale. That's uh, blood stained. It, it was an absolute mess. And all of that was, was, he had one above him, the female and the male beneath him, and he was feeding the female. And he had his hand by his side, which is concentrate on the female. And the male beneath him, all he did was just reach up and just like t test to see if his hand was around or not. And just the two frontal teeth just punctured his hand, lacerated his hand open. Um, and that was enough. It didn't even bite and hold on or anything. It wasn't it like clamped down or anything? Just, just a little taste to see what it was. And yeah. his hand was wrecked. You could see down into the adipose tissue. You could see bone. It was a mess. So yeah, Fran is a no joke. So obviously yeah. you've got obviously got a keen interest in the natural world. Have you have you always been this way? Or yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I've just I've always been interested in the way that uh, that that organisms are interrelated. Uh, I was fortunate enough that when I was in, in second grade, one of my my second grade teacher was. Uh, she gave me a book on dinosaurs that that was a gift, not just you know to read, but you know, to, to to keep. And it had a uh, cladogram in it. And when I read how you know the, the, the birds and the relationship to the dinosaurs and and all and you know cattle with goats and deer and giraffes and all of this, I mean, just I, it all makes sense. This is the this is the way this works out. And my family had this tradition that you don't indoctrinate children until they reach what they called the age of reason, which would be eight years old. Now, I'm already in second grade. I've already seen the cladogram. I understand how evolution works. I was the only person I knew, by the way, who even knew what evolution was, much less accepted it until I was a teenager. Absolutely every single person I met, with a single exception of possibly my second grade teacher, everybody, every adult was a creationist. Absolutely every single one. And I never was. So on my eighth birthday, I remember my mother coming in with a Bible. She's now going to begin the indoctrination process. And on my eighth birthday, she's going to have me you know, baptized in the Mormon church and start telling me that the Bible is the absolute truth and the revealed word of the one true God and all this. And when I, um, when I, I, at eight, I 
tried to read Genesis and tried to read the at least the first three chapters, right? And I I came away realizing that this is a metaphor. You know, when when they talk about woman or when they talk about Eve, they're not talking about some chick that actually lived whose name was Eve. She is representative of, you know, this this character of the first woman, and this is you know, and uh, and the the eat of the fruit of the tree of that's the results of choices made or actions taken, right? So you can either partake of you know life forever, or you can eat. You know, you can learn good from evil and become more than the animals. You would become like unto the gods because you would have morality. Obvious metaphor. This is a parable. This is a fable with a moral. This didn't really happen. I'm eight years old, and I'm trying to explain this to my parents and my grandparents who were biblical literalists and know fuck all about science. It was it was disturbing. So we didn't talk about such things like ever because it, it was it was always a descent into madness. It's probably the best way to be. I, I kind of avoid the subject in general, to be fair. I'm not really, I've never been raised anywhere near religion never been a big thing for me but i just don't touch it to be fair yeah don't touch the stuff i understand it's addictive does things to the brain <laughs> <laughs> i can i can imagine so obviously the big thing that everyone obviously wants to know is how what was the evolutionary origin of snakes in general okay the evolutionary origin of snakes was Roughly a hundred million years ago is when they 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 finally show up in the fossil record, uh, and it is and the first snakes in the fossil record have legs. There are a handful of them that have only their back legs, uh, and there's at least one true snake that has four legs. Now there's another there's another four legged snake that isn't a true snake, but it it and it has four legs. And I can't is that Tetrapodophus. I'm trying to remember, but it, again, it, it's about it's from the right time period in the wrong area, though, because we've got them in both the new world and the old world. So there was a there was a long period where snakes were uh, the, the the debate is over whether they were initially waterborne or whether they were initially um, subterranean, whether they were burrowers. And for me, the evidence favors burrowing. Although there are some marine snakes in the fossil record who were quite adept at, at being water snakes. Uh, there was one that was a full-on sea snake, couldn't live on land, but it, um, it was like 30 feet long. So this ridiculously big, 30 feet, that's big. The, the longest snake on record in, you know, historically was a reticulated python in 1907 or 1912, somewhere thereabouts that measured 32 feet, nine inches. So 10 meters, I think is what that, that comes out to. Uh, and th that's the size of the sea snake, but we've had plenty of other snakes that are burrowers and, and the, in the fossil record. And of course the most basal, the most primitive snakes that we have living today are again, burrowers. And there's a consistent trend and it's more, um, there's 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 a greater evolutionary pressure to reduce the limbs on a burrowing variety than on a marine variety because you know you, you've got uh, you've got seagoing lizards that the mosasaurs for example and among others because there's several others that the the arms became fins or flippers because that was the more advantageous thing to do you've got this appendage you can use it and so you invariably will in this environment but in burrowing what can you make your arms into they're just in the way and the, the best way that they can help is to get out of the way and that was to get rid of them so there's a there and we have a number of burrowing uh amphisbanids and a number of other things that have that like and some amphibians you know, sicilians and such that because they are burrowers they lost their limbs altogether so that that seems to be the stronger indication that that snakes began as burrowing animals first, and then they started developing these other adaptations. Um, the The first viper in the fossil record 
is quite recent. I'm trying to remember how recent. It was just in the last, it was within the last 10 million years. So, and I want to say the last 2 million years. There was a viper in Greece that was the, the biggest viper ever seen anywhere. Uh, it's like 15 feet long, something like that. Uh, oh, that's, that's huge. It, 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 yeah, it's equivalent to like a king cobra today, but it's a viper. And we, don't, and we have big vipers. I'm like our eastern diamondback is, I think that is uh, 9 or 10 feet by itself. And it's a big snake. It's a big bodied snake, too. So even if it didn't have the venom, you... It would still be a bad bite. Even if it didn't have fangs, it would still be a bad bite because it's such a big snake. And then the development of the fangs. When you look at henophiids, henophiids like the boas and pythons, they have uh, unusually large teeth. You know, the colubrids have relatively small. They're they're like lizard's teeth. They're just little bitty things. They'll hang on to the prey. And that's it. But but the, the the pythons and such, they have these great big stabbing fangs that plunge right through so that you're not getting away from that. And so the fangs on rear fanged colubrids is kind of like a combination of these. So you have the little lizard's teeth and then you get toward the back of the mouth and then suddenly you have one, two, maybe three on each side of these larger recurved teeth just like the henophiids have. So this is like a dormant gene that comes back. And there's pretty much no other explanation for why it would be in the back. That's that's not the efficient place. If you're going to buy a prey item, do it like the elapids and the vipers do, put it in the front. But the the, colub- the, the colubrids have it in the back. And this works for, for the type of, pre- you know, for small prey items that they're in just, but it doesn't work well for defense. So that's, they, they can still get you. It's just hard. It's hard for them to get. It's hard for them to, to get the fangs into you, and it's hard to get the venom into you. So they're 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 relatively not bad. Uh, there is one called a bo- boom slang in Africa. That is that is a rear fanged colubrid, and I think it's the only one that is consistently deadly. Others, it, it's medically significant venom. Some of them you require hospital. Uh, and and antivenom and that sort of thing and can cause quite nasty wounds, but not usually death. It's kind of like the American copperhead. That's a viper that the venom is not that bad. 0.01% of people die from a copperhead bite. Is that with medical care? I don't know. Uh, of, Of the people that are reported annually, this, this percentage, I know that net number zero point zero one percent so what is that is that a child that got bit you know out of all the people that get bit i mean there's 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 reactions sure you can have an allergic reaction uh to you you have the the, you have the the venom's natural ability to what it does to begin with but you can complicate that with an allergic reaction to it and i have to phrase it that way because i've seen heated arguments over this that your reaction to venom is not an allergic reaction, but you can have an allergic reaction to the venom so that it, it just amplifies what the venom, what the damage the venom was already going to do anyway. You can have a reaction to a hog nose bite or from my, my false water cobras behind me, and the, that will render the bite as bad as, say, a copperhead. And of course, some people can react to a bee sting by dying from it. You know, so people can have an allergic sensitivity that is heightened over what the venom would normally be expected to do. Uh, but with the uh, with the boom slang, you're in trouble if if you get bit by that. Interesting thing is, it takes a couple of days to die from it, but you're gonna you're gonna die. You and with the lapids too, they have a they have a neurotoxin that can be quite bad, but it doesn't. It's not really fast acting. So it's it's a little confusing to me how this how this evolved because you can get and if people have they've been bitten by cobras and stuff and and they'll walk around for a day or two and then die. Uh, like what, there was one guy on an expedition. And I was wish I could remember all the details of the story, but he got he got bit and he was in a very remote area where he couldn't get to help. He's able to walk. He's able to you know do, to function. He starts feeling discomfort. Several hours later, he's immobilized a few hours after that. And by the time they can get like a helicopter out to him, he's already dead. 
And there was somebody who got into the Darwin Awards. He got bit by a cobra and then like walked it off and declared himself immune to cobras and went out to a bar that evening and, and got drunk and died in the bar bragging that he was immune to cobras. It just takes a while to get you. And in the Lucky play, there was this kid, some 150-pound teenager, uh, who was doing a herping video. And he picked up, you can see it was out in Thailand, I think it was, and he picked up one of my favorite snakes. It's the, it's the Malayan blue coral. Now, this thing, it looks exactly like the red-headed crate. And they have an overlapping range, which is interesting. The, the two snakes are truly unique in all the world, yet they look exactly like each other. Bizarre. And they are different species. They, they have different venom. So on the outside, they look the same. But on the inside, the venom is different. So in the Malayan blue coral, they're both the lapids even. Uh, the Malayan blue coral has a venom chamber that is one quarter the length of its body. And it has not just a neurotoxin, it has a cytotoxin in there with it. So like uh, like timber rattlesnakes, for example, will have, they, they have this necrotic, I forget what the, what the type of venom is that, that, that rots the flesh, but then they also have a neurotoxin on top of that. The other one is, is it cytotoxic? Yes. And then there's, mm. there's a cytotoxin that can cause your body-wide muscle spasms. And in the Malayan blue coral, it's a fast-acting cytotoxin. So unlike with, with most elapid bites where you can walk around for a while before you realize, oh, wait, I'm having trouble moving and breathing and I and I can't walk anymore and oh shit now I am in trouble that with this it's immediate so you get bit by this thing and if you get a full of innovation you're going down in minutes and it's going to be body-wide muscle contortions like you have cramps all over your body your your whole body is going into these cramps until your and until your diaphragm and your heart your breathing and your heartbeat and everything just stops. So, but this kid, he's doing a video where he picks one of these things up by the tail and they're relatively docile snakes. So he picks it up by the tail and it doesn't strike at him. So he runs his hand along its body and it doesn't strike at him. So he's, he's just holding Amy laying blue coral in his bare naked hands going, isn't this a beautiful snake? And yeah, it is, but you're an idiot. And I, I hate when, when people who have, Deadly venomous snakes handle them freehand like this because it gives the impression that you can just go out in the jungle and pick one of these things up because that's what he did. And he's done it before. He's got a whole YouTube channel where he's doing this, picking up venomous snakes and getting away with it. And so he picks up this one. And it's funny that as he's putting it down, if I remember this video correctly, it's as he's putting it down, tail first, it comes back up and gets him in the finger. Just one fang gets him in the finger. And it caused his finger to swell up the next day. So he hit, takes a picture of his big old swollen finger, but that's it. So no venom. That's just a reaction from, from the, 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 the naked fang. You know, that lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very lucky. It's interesting you said there about that the snakes having like the lizard teeth apart from the fangs. Most people would be shocked to hear that it could you could describe snakes as lizards. Would you mind like going into that a little bit? Yeah, certainly. So, um, uh, snakes are a subset of lizards, and even even like the the old biblical story kind of makes that reference. The word serpent in the original context applied both to lizards and to snakes. So it wasn't specific. You, you've got, there are uh, medieval references to serpents where they, the serpent has wings or legs. So it's just that serpentine body. And, and if that was always applied to lizards, uh, I don't think serpent, well, there may have been one case where serpent was applied to a crocodilian. Yeah, I think Leviathan, the Levi Leviathan made a reference to a serpent when it's actually talking about a crocodilian. And there's some argument as to whether Leviathan describes a crocodilian. But uh, I, from what I've seen, the, the, their description is spot on. They talk about it having a mouth like two great doors and that all, all, they had all these armor-plated shields along its back that are all closely knit together. And just, lo just look at the picture of an alligator or a crocodile. That's what they're talking about. It's exactly this thing. That its tail looks like pot, or the pot shards and everything. All of it. They're, they're describing a crocodile. And they just happen to use the word 
serpent in there somewhere, probably because of that serpentine thing that they do. So when you have a, it's it's not that it stops being a lizard. It's still in the order Squamata. All snakes are in the order Squamata. They don't stop being lizards when they become snakes. Though conventionally, and we have a colloquial convention that we consider if it's, you know, that it's not a snake, any, that it's not a lizard anymore, it's become a snake now. But, you know, we're, we're, we're getting into monophyly and taxonomy now. So, no, it didn't stop. It's still a lizard. We are still apes. Birds are still dinosaurs. Birds didn't stop being dinosaurs when they became birds. Snakes didn't stop being lizards when they became snakes. And when they became snakes was not when they lost their legs. There are other lizards that lost their legs. But those other lizards don't have the other adaptations that are unique to snakes. Like snakes share with other lizards this jaw that is in two pieces. Their lower jaw is in two pieces. It's held together with a tendon, but in the skeleton, you can't see that tendon. So it's just two pieces of jaw like this. And this is what enables the, that tendon can stretch so that the lower jaw in, in, enables them to swallow things that are bigger than their head. And they're not the only ones that can do that. Monitor lizards have that same thing. They have the forked tongue and they have the, the expanding jaw. But then there's a number of other specific features that snakes have, like the type of ear that they have, because snakes don't have a visible external ear. And they don't have eyelids. Snakes cannot close their eyes. So you would think that snakes got the shit end of the stick here. They got, they got a raw deal somewhere. They, they lost their limbs. They lost their ears. They lost their eyelids. They lost one lung. And yet... Ironically, the ones with one lung, which we would think would be the weakest of all the snakes, is actually the strongest of all the snakes. And <clears throat> snakes are the most successful of the modern reptile groups in terms of the number of species proliferating worldwide. Hands down, the most, the most successful group. So far from being cursed, these guys with no arms and no legs can do things that lizards with arms and legs can't. They can climb better than some lizards with arms and legs can. It's bizarre. Yeah, we talked about, obviously you mentioned the mild venom still being apparent in iguanas. And is it also bearded dragons are a part of that as well? Yes, bearded dragons are iguanids. What current role would you say this mild venom might have? Like the digestion or is it just like on its way out with no purpose? Well, I'm going to say that it's on its way out. Uh, I the, the the hypothesis is that you know, whereas all all lizards started out as predators, some of them have adapted an omnivorous or herbivorous diet, and those that go to the the herbivorous diet don't use the venom like like most venom is designed for immobilizing the prey or for digesting the prey as you're eating it, and so. You don't kind of need that when you're eating fruits and vegetables. Yeah. And so the 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 venom, when when there was some generation that was born with a defect in that, the defect didn't count against them. So now they have a defective venom. It's still it's still technically venom, just probably not the potency that it used to be. But it no, nor does it matter anymore. It's interesting that because I've known people I used to work with Cyclura. I've known people who have taken like a, a bite from Cyclura and they got really, really irritable, like itchiness up their arm from from a bite from from an iguanid. So that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't actually know about them being like that mildly venomous in that way. Yeah, and and garter snakes was much the same thing. You you've got this weird itching sensation that you you don't get from most other things. It's kind of like. Um, I think there's a there's a dander that humans are allergic to from house cats. The, strangely, only house cats have this dander that we're allergic to. Wild cats don't. Why are we allergic to our own cats and not to the cats we find in the wild? But if you get a scratch from a cat, it, it's often quite bad. And it itches like a son of a bitch, doesn't it, when you get a scratch from a cat? And then I've heard that it's because of the dander. That, that's on the cat that you're allergic to that gets in there that causes it to be so very itchy. But then we've they've also figured out that the same thing with these uh, garter snakes. But the garter snake doesn't have any fangs, so it's got like no kind of venom delivery system, and it's not a very potent venom either. 
But if it works to the advantage, then on, in terms of population mechanics, you could see some lineage of garter snakes developing a subsequent mutation that better enhances that, that either increases the toxicity of the venom or improves the delivery system. And what you usually see in the develop in development of fangs, we've seen that a couple of times, both in the fossil record and, and in living examples today, there are some venomous animals that have a groove down the tooth. And then you can compare that both with living species today where the groove becomes more and more toward the center of the tooth so that they, the, uh, the, the groove is more, more inside the tooth, but still there's still a groove on the outside. It hasn't closed up completely, but then there's some where it's closed up completely. And now the groove just goes right through the middle and it has become a hypodermic syringe. The more isolated it is from the outside, the less diluted it will be. So the, the better the channel is, the better the delivery. So you have, a, you have an evolutionary pressure to continue that and to close that circle. But it's still, it's still more effective as it begins a circle than if there's no circle at all, if there's just a groove. And the, just the groove is more effective than not having a groove. And then when you have it closed, now you can pump pure venom in under pressure. So now all you need is a muscular contraction, which the snake can already do um, to some degree, just with the, with the musculature that's already there, minor enhancement, and now you're full on spitting cobra. Now you can shoot venom through the holes in your fangs. That would be a, a very different kind of guard snake. That'd be very interesting. <laughs> so everyone assumes that um, snakes are evolutionary linked to varanids. But I know there's some debate with mosasaurs and dolichosaurs as well. So could you go into that for us? Well yeah, it's not a it's not a direct link. Um so it's fair to say that the closest living relative of the mosasaurs uh is it well they're not living relative. The the yes, the closest living relative of mosasaurs is snakes and and monitor lizards um but there the, the there there is an intermediate that no longer exists between them we're only talking about living relatives so there is an extinct relative between the between the monitor lizards and between the mosasaurs and between the snakes between both sides and this is where your dolichosaurs come in for example uh and um the mosasaurs or the the varanids and the uh I forget the, what the, the family category for um, the Gila monsters and beaded lizards. Uh, Heloderma? My, there we go, Heloderma. Uh, there, there are intermediates, uh, morphological intermediates in the fossil record that like close up those gaps or show where, because you don't have one emerging directly from the other. We have the ancestor of all uh, Gila monsters and the ancestor of all mosasaurs, or excuse me, the, the ancestors of all monitor lizards. And there's a common ancestor between monitor lizards and mosasaurs. And, but that, that common ancestor just doesn't exist anymore. And then we also have one between mosasaurs and snakes. So there's, there, there's something to explain their ancient similarity, but not their modern similarity because these things grow apart. We know that there's a common ancestor between the Gila monster and uh, and Komodo dragon, for example. But whatever that was, was neither a Gila monster nor a Komodo dragon. It would have been something very different. It would have looked superficially probably like a uh, the Chinese earless monitor. Now, heavily armored, mostly aquatic at that time. So it wouldn't be technically correct to say that mosasaurs came from varanids rather than it's just a common ancestor i think actually that mosasaurs um they're not varanids but they're so very close they're they're often grouped in with varanids but they're but they're they're not actually part of the same mosasaur it's yeah it's a but very 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 close virtually indistinguishable if you go back to the earliest uh, Dallasaurus, which is a diminutive, like two foot long mosasaur that was found here in Dallas, where I live, virtually indistinguishable from a monitor lizard. And then there's a there's a prequel to that one, which has traits implying mosasaur, but also has traits implying varanids. You could call it either or both. 
So very, very close. So yes. the modern uh, opinion then among taxonomists, um, do they know sort of what direction snakes come from? Or is it just this kind of muddy pool area they know it came from this sort of area in general? I don't understand. I don't think I understood the question there. So it's not a case of, oh, yeah, it's this direct line from snake, mosasaur, blah, 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 blah. It's like this sort of area um, that they, they've oh, yeah. originated uh, so, so from. So snakes did not come from mosasaurs. They, 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 when you go back to something that is the, and I forget what the prequel name was, but, you know, that's that something that. It's so close to a mosasaur that if this is all you had of it, you would call it a mos. You would call it. I'm sorry. It's so close to a varanid that if this was all you had, you would call it a, a basal varanid. But it's also a basal mosasaurid. But it's because it has the indications. But because it has the indications of both, then it should be a parent category and not necessarily belong to either subset. So the classification is is that you, this this is the parent group from which both emerged. Snakes, however. Uh, came from a sister group from Varanids, and this is, I think, you know, where the where the Dolichosaurus and such come from. Uh, they're also a sister group, and at some point, hundred to one hundred and ten million years ago, somewhere thereabouts, we we don't have fossils for you know with the earliest fossils we have is a hundred million years ago, so we can't know beyond what the data shows. But the, it, 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 these animals started out evidently as burrowers. And they lost the front legs first, for whatever reason. And so, and they kept the back legs. So you've had two or three species: uh, Hasiophysis uh, and uh, Terrasanctus, uh, no, or no, Hasiophysis, Terrasanctus, and uh, I forget what the other one is, Problematicus, Pachyricus. But you have a number of snakes that don't have any front legs whatsoever, but they kept the back legs, and the back legs are really tiny. Oh, and I should say. That the ones with the front legs are also really stupidly tiny. So these legs were already useless long before they were gone. And the interesting thing, you, you, the people who argue that, you know, against snake evolution are the very ones who also believe that the Genesis story is true and the snakes lost their legs, but they can't have lost their legs this way because you have fossils of legs that are so small in comparison to the body, they can't physically be used as legs which means they precisely fit the definition of what a vestigial feature is they may still a vestigial feature does not necessarily mean useless but it can't it has to have a diminished capacity of its original use or it has to have uh, a, a a newly acquired function so it's used for something else for example like uh, you know penguins obviously used their wings for flying at some point in their distant past but they're flippers now so they've they've, they've ad have adapted another. So it's vestigial as far as flying, but you know functional as, as far as swimming. These legs, however, the front legs, no function, none at all, and the back legs cannot function as legs. What are you going to do with a tiny set of back legs that are all the way at the back of the snake? Contrary to some people say, it's not the snakes have long le long necks and long tails. They actually have quite short necks and really short tails. That's long body, oddly enough. And so the back legs on a snake are way back toward the toward the end. Uh, and these are so tiny that you really have to zoom in to see that there's legs there at all. And we have a number of, of, uh, of lizards that are like that today. Some that lost their legs entirely, some that still have itty bitty little legs, just just pathetically puny, useless as legs. And this and these are on, on animals that still exist. So the snake started out this way. They kept the back legs. There was one function they could use for the back legs, and that was clasping together in breeding, which henophiids can still do. So henophiids have they don't they don't have so much they don't have a pelvis really anymore. There's some fossil snakes that still have a pelvis. What henophiids have is they have um, the two femurs and one claw on either end, and so it, right at the cloaca you have these little claws, you know, turn a ball python over and look at the claws near, near the cloaca. During mating, these uh, are will come out and clasp or stimulate. So they, uh, you know, <laughs> the way you do. And 
that's that's the only function they have with these. And of course, then you get into colubroids. They don't have, they don't have these uh, vestigial femur claws. Anyway, what are the cloacal spurs? They call them. The, 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 the colubroids don't have those anymore at all. They just figured out how to mate without that. They because snakes developed that because they realized that these clasper things don't work very well. They have to wrap their bodies around each other and get into what they call a lock. So they have to breed that way. And how they breed is bizarre. Uh, you, it, it's it, they're usually not sexually dimorphic with the false water cobras. You can kind of tell superficially by looking at them. The males tend to be the black and white, and the the females tend to be the yellow, green, and and black. Uh, but if there's a color difference that normally happens with the, uh, and not always, but normally happens uh, with sexual dimorphism in that group. But otherwise, the only way to tell the gender of snakes is by probing them. So you have to stick this device in their cloaca and see if you can pull out a, a hemi penis, because they have a two headed penis that is nightmarish <laughs> yeah a hideous movie movie monster sort of thing and and a lot of and lizards are similarly equipped of course it's it's funny when you say how your first foray into all of this is through dinosaurs so many of the guests that have come on here have said that dinosaurs have been the main thing that triggered all of them for this i assume you're equally into dinosaur taxonomy as you are into into snakes and whatnot i was actually more into uh the reptile aspect and when i was a kid you know when i was in the 1960s uh in the early 70s dinosaurs were considered just lizards they were considered cold-blooded lizards even though there has been sufficient evidence even in the 19th century to declare them warm-blooded and this was known i mean darwin knew it huxley knew it and these people wrote about it that there's all this evidence that these things are warm-blooded but they couldn't accept that they were warm-blooded because like sir richard owen for example was convinced that reptiles had to be cold-blooded therefore bad parents and evil and only on the only way you could have good parents is if they were warm-blooded and the, the only way you could have moral or caring animals as if they're warm-blooded so you get the analogy of being a cold-blooded killer so they insisted in and and sir richard owen lied a lot in his paperwork in his work to in order to reinforce his biases so he he was determined to to in to dismiss any evidence at all that birds were descended from dinosaurs or that or that dinosaurs could have been warm-blooded despite all the evidence and he he was indicted for it in the in the royal society for for misrepresentation on a couple of different things for the way he misrepresented the evolution of birds by comparing archaeopteryx to pterosaurs instead of to theropods which was a deliberate obfuscation and misdirection and also he made up an area of the brain that he said that apes had that humans don't have. And so if we evolved from apes, we would have to have this. And Thomas Huxley called him out for it because no one who has ever dissected the, the brain of an ape has found this, that it agrees with Professor Owen or has found this thing. He made it up. And eventually, uh, eventually Richard Owen was the, like the leading foremost and most respected authority of his day. But his, his religious convictions got in the way of his science to the point that they eventually drummed him out of the Royal Society, and he was a disgrace. That that is crazy. The fact that people can sway the science. I suppose people do it nowadays. You can read a paper nowadays. You can you can clearly see heavily biased writing throughout it. So it's not that un under it's not. What am I trying to say? It's not difficult to understand that even back then people were swaying entire areas of science to suit some sort of agenda. So dinosaurs aren't reptiles. <laughs> well, cladistically they are, but then so are birds. So uh, it, it, Vel Velociraptor is a raptor in the same way that an eagle is a raptor. And an eagle is a, is a, is a, is a dinosaur, and so is a chicken. It's interesting how it all all kind of stems in this this sort of same area, isn't it? 
And now I was fascinated with dinosaurs, uh, but I, I was more fascinated by, by the earlier form of them. The the alongside the dinosaurs in the Triassic, before the emergence of dinosaurs, there were uh, um, Crocodilla morpha, and, there, and this, these are. Am I saying that right? I think so. So archosaurs divided into, well, reptiles divided into two main groups as lepidosaurs and archosaurs. And somewhere in there you have uh, the, the ichthyosaurs, more, which are typically taken as more on the lepidosaur side. Likewise, you have turtles, which are more on the archosaur side. They have hard, hard shelled eggs, for example, which implies that they're aligned with the archosaurs. But otherwise, it's lepidosaurs one side, archosaurs on the other side. And then on the archosaur side, that side went to Cruatarsi or to uh, Ave Meditarsalia. On Cruatarsi, you have animals that look like dinosaurs looked in our old black and white movies from 100 years ago. If you go back to the oldest dinosaur movies and look at the way the dinosaurs look, where they're cold-blooded, sluggish, awkward-looking things that, that some of them stand up in a, in a weird way that is not bird-like at all, Crocodilomorpha included things that looked just like that. So the, the, those old black and white movie monsters existed. They just weren't dinosaurs. They were a slightly more primitive variant. And I was more kind of impressed with that sort of thing. And for whatever reason, I found the prior dinosaur uh, eras to be more interesting. Uh, things like the Carboniferous and especially the Permian. The Permian was it was a whole different biosphere than than we have or than the dinosaurs did. So that's going back into the Paleozoic instead of the Mesozoic. And there were everything you would expect to find in a wilderness setting today, like uh, you know, gopher-like animals or a hippopotamus-like animal. It's just that they're very different things. The gophers have tusks and beaks. And the the uh, the hippopotamus has antlers, and neither of them are mammals. Neither are they reptiles. So they're somewhere between our old uh, 19th century concept of what a reptile is, and you know, Richard Owen would have said that they were. As a matter of fact, he did. He said they were mammal-like reptiles. But we understand the word reptile differently now. So reptiles now are diapsids. These were synapses, so they were never reptiles at all. But it's just a naming convention. There were weird ass things in the Permian. There was one of these that one of the uh, was it was it a cynodont? No, it's a disynodont. It had the beak and tusks. Just think about that: a beak and tusks at the same time. And there were a bunch of different kinds of these. One of them was the size of an elephant. Just imagine what in a bizarre world that is. So if you had a time travel device and you could find yourself in the Permian, how confusing would that be? Because there's not going to be any animal you recognize. Not, virtually nothing from the, the, the plastic pieces in the prehistoric play set. Nothing. You wouldn't recognize any of these things. Uh, the A lot of the bugs that you would see would not be insects at all. They would be eurypterids, which are like sea scorpion, kind of, which are not technically not scorpions, but some of them are creeping around on the land and they're quite huge and, and disturbing looking. And the the ocean is full of ammonites of different types and of eurypterids and of actual scorpions that are up to four feet long. Uh, and, and the plants, the jungle, everything would be entirely different. The, the plant life would be largely fungus. You would, you would have things that are fungus that are 100 feet high. It's a completely alien world. You wouldn't even you would think that you were on another planet before you would realize that this is early Earth. Is that the time period where Gorgonopsid and things are from? Exactly. Yeah. Gorgonopsid comes cool. from the end of this period where it's not lush anymore. Uh this would be the the Great Dying, which was uh, attributed to the Siberian traps, was a a volcanic eruption the size of the United States or Australia uh, and that went on for a hundred thousand years. So poisoning the atmosphere, raising the, the raising the, uh, the, the, the temperature of the planet to the point that it released 
13 trillion tons worth of frozen methane in the seafloor and further raised the the, temp- the global temperatures so that global warming took out the oxygen in most of the oceans. 90% of the ocean life died. 90%. So no more trilobites. Uh, and the ammonites made it through that, but the, the earlier form, the, uh, the orthocones didn't, and uh, a whole lot of other things. Did. Most things didn't. Yeah, it's a, it would have been an amazing time to see things from them. Could you imagine the weird things that people would try to keep if it was like herpt culture nowadays? You wouldn't even recognize half of what people are trying to breed. Yeah, so let's go into... Sucus. My favorite would have been Eustaminosuchus. That's the hippo with antlers. That I mean, <laughs> that, that would be fun to have. Uh, Thrinaxodon would be another another great example. That 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 one uh, Dicynodont, the size of an elephant, would be hysterical to look at. You th- you think that this is a this is must be a special effect from the you know Star Wars Episode Four, <laughs> because that's actually what it looked like. I think we've been going for an hour and a half, roughly now. So, is there anything that you wanted to cover at all before? No, we... I appreciated being able to talk about this because I don't, you know, on my channel, it's not about this, so I I don't get to talk about this very much. Yeah, maybe you should start a uh, a secondary reptile channel. Maybe. Well, actually, I do. I just haven't contributed to it yet. <laughs> so, well, if you give me the link, I'll link it below. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me, Aaron. I really appreciate this episode. It's wonderful to talk about prehistoric reptiles and prehistoric snakes, not just the current snakes and how we keep them. Some of you are going to really know that on this, and I think that some of you are going to be like, eh, this isn't about like keeping snakes. Understandable. I loved this episode. I loved talking to Aaron, and I'm sure some of you will too. So thank you again for joining us, Aaron. It was a fantastic episode. If you'd like to check out Custom Raptor Habitats for premium PVC enclosures, there'll be a link in the description below. If you'd like to help out and help with running this show, then check out Patreon slash Reptiles and Research. And if you want to help out with the ball python deep dive, then go to the link in the description or it's GoFundMe slash F slash the ball python deep dive project. Other than that, thank you very much and we'll see you in episode 20.